All right, good morning folks and welcome. I can see attendees are starting to flow in. I'm just gonna give us a little bit of time while those attendees keep flowing through. All right, we're up to uh, our second dozen. Looks like you're all still flowing in. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, I still see attendees flowing in, so I'm just gonna give it a little bit more time before I kick us off here. All right, just before we get started here, I'm gonna provide some context to ultimately what we're doing here today. So we at Conservice are gonna be looking to conduct a series of episodes in 2023. Um, we really appreciate nothing more than getting in touch with our community and speaking to our, our, our growers, our ag community, and those that are involved in the industry. Um, if you want to make sure that you're invited to these moving forward, please ensure that you follow Conservice on LinkedIn. We'll make sure to constantly put the invitations out there and get the word out to help build attendance. So I want to welcome everyone to today's presentation, the Ag Tech Tipping Point. A big thank you for everybody being uh, for being here with us today and happy Friday. So before we dive in, I'm gonna talk through some housekeeping items. All of you have automatically come into this webinar on mute. So if you've got a dog barking in the background, that's not gonna disturb us today. Um, today's content is gonna feel like a presentation, but it's really intended to be interactive, right? We want to hear from you. So I want everybody right now with me, take your cursor or your mouse and kind of move it around the screen in front of you. That's gonna actually populate a toolbar at the bottom of your screen, okay? Within that toolbar is a Q&A. As Patrick is talking to us this morning, you can type in your questions there. They're not gonna disrupt him. He'll keep going and we can circle back to those questions near the end. Um, and if you miss something during the content this morning, don't worry about it. We will send out a recording within a couple weeks to everyone who registered for the event. Uh, next slide, please, Pat. So my name is Kristen. I lead our marketing department at Conservice. And in my years with the company, I've been very fortunate to interview a wide array of growers. Um, growers that are ranging from 3,000 acres up to 55,000 acres. These folks are growing everything from nuts and wild blueberries to uh, cotton, hops, and hemp. So wide diversity of products as well. And while all those farms are unique, what's really not unique is at the end of those interviews, so many growers have pulled me over and they've said, you know what, at the end of the day, farming is a business. And I specifically think of one grower who brought me out to their big equipment shed, right? There's big John Deere tractors. And he's pointing to this line, a, a flood line, ultimately, that spanned their entire garage. And he said, you know, years, we years ago, we suffered a flood. And in that flood, we lost a lot, but what we did not lose was all of our historical farm data, right? I did not lose that. He was so grateful that he did have a cloud-based system to store everything that's happened on their farm over the last decade. And I really think that running a business is about managing risk. And I think Patrick's going to touch on this today. Um, and so without further ado, I am excited to introduce to you Patrick Christie, co-founder and president of our company. When I think of Pat, Pat is a true entrepreneur. He started his very first company at the age of 20. Um, his work with this global data services company, WAMnet, was instrumental, okay? At the age of 28, WAMnet actually won a contract to build a connected communications platform for the U.S. Navy, okay? A connected communications platform, similar to our work, but a little bit different here at Conservice. So there, he expanded the business and he he executed on what ultimately became a $20 billion project, okay, the largest IT federal program to date. 
Then in 2009, he launched Conservice to focus on enterprise sustainability and to help solve meaningful problems for farmers. So for Pat's full career, he has really lived at the intersection of new ideas meets adoption. He's taken these manual paper-based processes and moved them into digital connected systems, workflows that are working either at a farm level, um, depending on what type of business he's been in, right? So really enabling the human skills Set. And I can say that in my years at Conservice, you know, Pat spends a lot of time with growers, big and small. He participates in events like the Global Farmers Masterclass in Brazil, where he's really listening to some large scale growers talk about uh, challenges and solutions out there. So he really has global expertise. But what I also appreciate about Pat is that he is also in the field, right, making sure that technology is easy to use, that it matches the workflows that are already happening on the farm and that technology ultimately provides insights that growers can really rely on. And so on that note, I want to welcome Pat. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, it's always hard to hear someone else talk about yourself, so don't believe everything she says. Uh, the one thing I will say that's true, though, is I love what I do. And I see there's a lot of people on this call that uh, either we've spent a lot of time together or maybe we've met once in a while, but I think the one thing that's clear is everybody that's here cares deeply about what's happening in agriculture, and uh, that includes me. So I'm glad you are here. So let's get into it. You know, really what I want to cover in this short time is the changing dynamics of what's happening on farm. You know, ag tech is not new, and we'll talk about that. But I think what we're starting to see is really the, the gap between what technologies work where are they going to emerge? How do they continue to work on behalf of the grower or those who supply things to the grower? And 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 what the farmer is really doing? I mean, it's it's uh, it's a wide array of use cases, and and frankly, uh, uh, what we're seeing now is is adoption starting to happen at a rate that's pretty dramatic compared to the last ten years. And, and uh, I'll talk talk to that. But but first and foremost, you know, one of the things I love about working with farmers across the world is we're all entrepreneurs, right? We're all trying to figure out how to run our businesses better, how to solve a problem that's not easy to solve, how to find an edge that no one has. <clears throat> and when you do it right, it's for the long haul, right? Uh, no one does this for uh, short-term thinking. This is all long-term thinking. And, and it's something that uh, I enjoy. And it's, and it's one of the things that the partners we work with uh, 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 solidify every day. You know, for those of you that may not know, we were recently acquired uh, by uh, Rabobank and TELUS, kind of the two largest farm-facing independent platforms in the world. And when you spend time with them, it's all about really trying to connect the dots to bring good solutions to a caring client. And that's hard to do, and it takes time. Uh, so, um, so as I'm going through this, I'm confident some of you on this call are going to have pointed hard questions. I can't wait for them. Uh, but, you know, there's a practical reality. You know, I used to say this, I think I can still say this. We don't have a technology problem across agribusiness. We really have a use problem. And you could argue that the use problem is a function of getting these systems to work together, making it possible for all members of the farm, whether it be somebody running a grain cart, whether it's someone in the back office, my grandfather who's working part-time, the part-time bus driver, uh, all the way into permanent crops. We have clients in Australia that you know, they'll have 500 temporary workers come onto a field to do work. How do you, how do you engage with such a dynamic uh, industry? And, and frankly, there's just a lot of, um, you know, see, this is nice that Steve wrote a nice article about what's happening in the industry. This, this notion that we talk about ag tech but when you really get onto the farm field and you really start to look at it, there's still a lot of digital duct tape, right? There's still a lot of uh, on-prem systems, you know, that doesn't talk. And frankly, there's a lot of paper still. So uh, this is a real issue and an opportunity. Now, I've been a part of surveys. I'm sure all of you have. Sometimes you see survey results and you're like, there's no way that's true. I mean, really 60% of producers don't have any type of ag tech. That, that, that's just hard for me to believe. I, I think our farmers are incredibly adept. I mean, everybody's, not everybody, the smartphone is an enabler for a changing dynamic. 
uh, but I can understand if you were to really dig into maybe other industries, you know, look at any other manufacturing industry and how much digital capability has been brought into those sectors and how it's really transformed some of the businesses. Agriculture has a long ways to go. Now, why is that? Uh, you know, uh, is it because the systems are too expensive? Is it because uh, people don't have time? You know, in my experience, on a typical farm, there's, you know, 12 jobs and four people. And the thing that doesn't get done is the thing that's the least fun to do. And usually that's paperwork and data, moving data between systems. And so, you know, how do you start to streamline that or fill the void? You know, and filling the void may not be technology. It might be people. And so as you think about the path to sustaining a competitive advantage, uh, how do you really start to, to, to narrow in to find those opportunities? One of the things we see time and time again is just managing the pennies to find the pounds. How do you manage every purchase? How do you make sure you got what you paid for? Not necessarily did you get the highest yield, right? So how do you, how do you really sit in between all of those workflows that sit on your farm, all of those decisions that at any point could improve your profit, could improve your operating footprint. And it may not be what's in the tractor. It may be everything around the tractor. And so that seems like a lot of work, but it is a way to get that competitive advantage. It is becoming a place where profits can be more obviously found, especially with interest rates climbing, commodity price volatility, all the things that we deal with. Uh, in the sector. And in, and in many cases, it's now labor scarcity. I mean, uh, uh, you know, it's just amazing how many of our farm, even the Midwest, you know, we, I'm based in Minneapolis. Uh, most of our team is based in Minneapolis, but we have clients and, and, and team members across uh, North America and Australia. And uh, uh, the diversity of workforces, you know, we're seeing Ukrainian workers in the Midwest, uh, South Africans, you go to Australia, it's a, it's a wide array of, of workers. It's not, it's not Australians. Um, and so it's, it's a real issue getting, getting access to talent. And, uh, and, and with that comes the whole life cycle of the farm. How do you start to bring these systems to bear in a way that actually is valuable and creates that edge? And then to pile on top, right? There's all of these programs. I mean, whether it be a, uh, a supply chain mandate, you know, General Mills had a program for a million acres of sustainable farmland. That doesn't mean that General Mills is going to pay a premium for that crop. What it means is if you live into their supply chain mandate, you have a you have the right to sell into that supply chain. And sometimes just having that right is its own advantage. You've got a known buyer who's, who's a consistent buyer. Uh, uh, but this is just a spattering. There's so many of these starting to come to bear. And I'll pick on one just for fun because I think it's, it's, uh, it's an unfortunate one. Uh, carbon. You know, is carbon really going to become a payoff for the grower? Uh, for many, it is, and for many, it isn't. And it depends on practices and the value of carbon and the liability that you may hold with carbon. But no matter what, you you don't have that optionality until you start to organize that that information in a way that lets you lens into what should I do? How can I start to collect all of the right data, get it in a quality environment where I can point it? How do I turn data into my tool as, as opposed to, to my you know, work I do after dinner? Right? How, how do I start to, to weaponize my information? And some of these programs are at the heart of how you weaponize it, but it all starts really with getting that platform on place at the farm gate. So, you know, the notion that data is in silos, uh, uh, it's actually more than that. We should have pictures of people here. Data sits in all forms. It sits in my head. It sits on a piece of paper in my truck. It sits in my John Deere Op Center, my climate field view, my agar and permanent crops. It sits in my accounting system. It may sit at my retailer or my off taker. And so these, these, these data sets are not easily connected. And more than likely, it requires a person to do something for it to become useful. Now, we've been at this for over 10 years. Uh, it's the, probably the longest 10 years of my business life. It's amazing how difficult and how much time it takes to start to make these things work, but it's working, it's happening. 
you know, a, 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 this notion that we're at the end of the beginning, right? This this reality that these silos are starting to become organized. There is the need for people to do this in a way that makes it easy to use. Uh, uh, and it's not just at the farm, it's everything around the farm that's starting to make that possible, uh, which actually makes what we do more valuable for all of our clients uh, uh, from here and beyond. So, so let me maybe just take a second to step back. And uh, uh, this isn't just an eye chart, although we could use it as an eye chart. You know, the, the numbers, I could probably cite several different places, but for simplicity, over the last two years, just the last two years, there's been $5 billion invested in very unique, very interesting food and ag tech companies. Everything from digital sensors to you know, cold chain monitoring for food safety and optimization of supply chain to post-harvest opportunities to make sure that every load is being captured. But a lot of these tend to be narrow and deep. Or, or, or worse, uh, wide and narrow, right? How does any buyer sort through this? Now, I mean, I, used, I came from, you know, at one point in my life a long time ago, you know, worked with large scale IT systems and, you know, buying technology was a very regimented process. You put an RFP together, you knew exactly what you needed. There was a business analyst that would help you determine what you want. That happens sometimes, but not most of the time. And so, you know, as farmers, as as producers of, of food and crops and fuel and fiber, how do we sort through uh, this array? And and what we're finding is is kind of a, a barbell is emerging. There's thousands of really innovative entrepreneurial led companies, you know, really doing smart things. That doesn't mean what they've solved for is something that you'll use. But they're so, they're great engineering, great technologies. You have some that are actually incredibly useful and you, you, you know it because you're probably using it or you see your friend using it. They're, they're innovative, it's smart, it solves a problem that matters and you get massive adoption. Now, on the other side of the barbell is it's called time. And with time, you're starting to get some real platforms. You know, what does a platform mean? A platform is where you can start to really have a lot of capabilities that seamlessly work together that can be brought to a client in a way that makes it easy to consume. And so one example of a platform is John Deere. John Deere Op Center has continued to build a fantastic array of capabilities and interconnections. We connect with them. Another one is FieldView, now owned by Bear, Bear FieldView. Another fantastic platform. There's more like that. TELUS Agriculture is doing a similar thing, bringing these companies together. So as these big platforms start to form, you get commitment to product ease of use, you have a better buying mindset, uh, and it's a place for these innovative companies to eventually find a home or connect with. But this is the world that we see, uh, and it's across all sectors, uh, livestock, cropping, permanent crops, dairy. Uh, this is the natural evolution. And I, and I think the hardest thing for us as an ag tech company is you know, working with our growers to actually help sort through and pick the best partners and where the ecosystem sits. And what's not on this ecosystem are all the service providers and the domain experts that actually sit around the farm gate. And if you believe, this is a belief question, that we're at a tipping point in tech. I mean, I don't, I don't think anybody on this call that's working around technology at the farm would say there's not enough tech trying to find me. I think there's plenty of technology trying to find me. It comes back to how do I really uh, laser in on the place that I'm gonna get the best investment return and gives me the ability to grow uh, when I'm ready to grow, to grow beyond what's possible or connect to other things. You know, this idea of sustainability and regulatory challenges being real, you know, look, sustainability starts with profit. Uh, you know, uh, when times are great, profits may be easy, uh, uh, but profit is its own franchise. Knowing how to stay profitable over time, I don't care what business you're in, but when you get one crop a year, one paycheck a year, I think it makes it a, a heck of a lot harder. And you know, compound that with regulatory. California, it's water, right? Uh, 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 carbon and nitrogen management, uh, food supply chain. Th those are all opportunities and challenges, uh, which leads to you know, how do you run the business? And this this is a very obvious stack, but for every one of you, if you tip, if you peel this apart, you're going to have a stack of problems you're trying to solve, and you're trying to figure out how to do it. 
the most reliable, high quality way that's repeatable. It becomes part of your advantage if you do it right. So what does this mean? How do you start to move from eye charts to action? Um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to oversimplify and then I'm going to kind of magnify the oversimplification. What we've observed time and time again across all farm types, small family farms to the largest of corporate farms, is that there is a consistent dialogue around workflow. How do you do your work? What is the information that's required for that work to be done on time, at the right level, at the right quality, where you can do one thing once, I can go and spray it, I can go and seed, and I can take that one activity and I can now know what my cost of production is. I can file my FSA reports. I can work with my crop insurance team. I can make sure that my tractors were properly uh, configured for the work they're supposed to do. How do you start to do that? And it starts with the workflow. Now, once you have your workflow, you can start to determine where do I get my information? How do I make sure it's quality, it's good information? And then how do I get it easy? Because frankly, we're all doing this in every business today. It's just the difference between a text message and a sticky note or a nicely organized piece of digital information that comes into an organized container that you can now have tell you what happened or you can query or you can compose it into that report going to General Mills for your sustainably produced crop. Uh, easy to say, hard to do. Here is our approach. It's not ours uniquely. Uh, I think you'll find that, again, this is people do this today. This is in your head. It's in a spreadsheet. It works really well when the workflow is simple. But as the business gets more complicated and you want to do more with less, more work with less people, more acres with the same people, uh, change the way you finance, modify your relationship with your landowners, uh, work more closely with your bank or your CPA advisory firm, all these things start to become complex. And so bringing these pieces together in a digital form is one way to do it. Again, you're maybe doing it today on paper, you may be doing it today in spreadsheets, but as you start to bring this together in a digital form, two things happen. Lots of things happen, but I'll focus on two. You start to get one data set that gives you an incredible timely view of your business in the moment. Accounting systems are laggard. They tell you what you've done. A work management system may tell you what you're about to do. How do you start to bring all this information to give you that in-season, real-time view on your business? And at each one of these points, it's probably not fully digital, or maybe even worse, you don't want it to be digital. You probably don't want your financial data just to flow into your operations. You want the right information coming together at the right time. And what we, what we see is one of three things. The farm has the people power, which could be time, desire, capability to do it. Because if they don't, this ends up looking like the exercise bike that you bought the day after January 1st that you thought you were going to put to work, it ends up in the basement with, you know, laundry hiding it because you don't want to be reminded of that decision because these systems, I don't care, paper, Excel-based or digital cloud-based systems all require effort. And so our farm clients either have that capability themselves and they're actually turning it into their competitive advantage. They're, they're lensing into having something that is unique and gives them a view for the future that they didn't have before. Two, they're working with third parties. They're working with third parties to populate this information, to help them organize it, but still putting it into a system that's theirs so they can access it anytime, anywhere, and they use it as their weapon as they run their business. Uh, and third, there's companies like us that also are providing some of that, cap that buffer around the system. How do I actually get the most out of our system? So we're a system, we build technology, but our business is really about making sure the technology is used. How do we help you use it? How do we help your partners work with you to use it? Because if it's not used, 
uh, we don't have a business and you're not getting the advantage. So, you know, the takeaways are very straightforward, but again, they take time to understand if you're not already here. In a wide array of options where ag tech is pervasive, what is ag tech? Let's, let's narrow it down. Let's, let's make it about your farm, your business, and really try to understand your workflows, where your domain expertise sits. You know, I'll give you another example. Farms that we've worked with, they may be better at marketing than agronomy. So what matters to them is cost of production, inventory management, my budgeted position to actual position, contracts. We have other farms that are more focused on inventory control for my Kempford seed going into the field or my labor management and, and, and pecans and almonds in California. There's a workflow you care about. Solve it with efficiency and information. And if you need help, get that domain expertise. It will become your competitive advantage. It may not happen the first cycle. Sometimes that first cycle is, you know, you scrape your knees learning how to ride the bike the first time. But that second cycle is when the wind's in your hair and you're starting to catch what's possible. And where we've seen the biggest lift in ROI with our clients, there's a first year lift, but it's that second and third and fourth. It's that stair step of value that starts to build. And it's having a place where you can continue to assess your future needs and priorities. And I would argue it takes action. You need to really invest in understanding. You know, education leads to informed decision making. Uh, you know, I spend a lot of time trying to educate, not always sell. I mean, we are in business, so, you know, we have to sell what we do. But frankly, education is the key to everyone's success. And, uh, you know, acting today is not just about buying. Acting today is about understanding what's possible, investing in the capability set that fits your business, and being ready for the wave of uh, opportunity ahead. We started this company in 2008. We started on farm in 2010. We've now seen farms in South America, uh, Russia, Ukraine, Australia, Canada. I mean, we, we're, the array of farms we've seen, the one thing that amazes me is time and time again, when you break down, no matter what farm you are and where you are, if it doesn't work in the field, it's not going to work in the head shed. So you have to have easy to use tools at the field or easy ways to get information from the field that you can then bring up into the broader business set. And uh, again, it goes back to workflow. How do you connect the dots? And so I think that's my, my timer. Should I stop there? Did, did I scare everybody off? Do we still have attendees? We still do have attendees, Pat. Thank you for that. And we've got one question that's come in around the carbon market. As a farmer, how can I tap into the carbon market? Great question. So uh, there's a variety of programs around carbon opportunities. Every program has its uh, a, a unique perspective on what data set you need from the field, what practices need to be either have occurred or will need to occur. And then that information gets combined into a scientific calculator and then gets brokered into a carbon market. So we're working with Rabo has a carbon bank. Uh, we work with Nori, which is also a facilitator of carbon credits, uh, but but it actually starts with understanding where you want to participate in a carbon scheme, and then how that may relate to your crop type. And uh, it, it's an emerging market. I would argue carbon is still a little bit confusing, but I'd be happy to uh, uh, set you up with some folks uh, uh, that we know that can help uh, uh, maybe give you some some guided uh, uh, paths on on how to find out more. We have helped our farmers collect that information and bring it into carbon calculators so that they can connect the dots from practice to carbon credits uh, over the life cycle of that farm field and crop. Pat, next question. I'm concerned about my data. What kind of data hmm. security is there in ag tech? <laughs> That's a great question. Well, step number one is don't leave your password Password, all right? So security starts with the user. Uh, we, we see that a, a very often. But I think beyond that, there's two types of security to be uh, thoughtful about. One is 
the actual security of your data, the physical and logical security? Is it been has it been organized in a database that has the right level of encryption that is uh, uh, not easily uh, obtainable by anyone? So that's that's a physical, logical, you know, data security set of protocols. Young companies may not be and will not be as mature as companies like John Deere, ourselves, client. I mean, just you know, we've invested, especially being owned by a publicly traded company and a bank. I mean, our 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 you know, this 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 is a, not quite Fort Knox, but you know, there's there's a lot of locks and keys and latches to keep that data secure practically. But if your password, if your username is you know Pat and your password is Pat, doesn't matter how many locks and keys are uh, uh, in there. The second is right to use, which is about data use. And that's usually embedded in the user license agreement and user license agreement, which is anywhere from 10 to 400 pages long to understand what the real rights are for data that may be in that system. And, uh, you know, us, for example, the farmer's data is always the farmer's data. We don't aggregate, we don't sell it. There's nothing. That's our business. There are some ag tech companies that have a low cost or even no cost uh, business model where that data is actually their business. It's how do they harmonize that data and make it useful for somebody else. So in that case, the devil's in the details. You have to, you know, those are two separate questions. Are you secure and how secure are you? And the second is, what are you doing with my data and how do I make sure it doesn't get used in a way that, that you're not happy with? Now, having said that, I use Google. I'm happy to share my data with Google because I get a lot of results, uh, usually ads I don't want, but I get a lot of results from Google that uh, you know I'm happy to contribute me as the product in that case. So it's trade-offs. Pat, we've got a comment from Russell, and I love this. Not to be a contrarian, but I submit that rather than comparing action versus reaction, it's more appropriate to term proactive versus reactive, right? Being proactive implies planning before action. Yeah, I, uh, potato, I completely agree with that, actually. I think that's a that's a valid, that's a very valid and practical way to think about it. I couldn't agree more. And, and that actually goes back to that sustainable, durable business, right? You, if you're building for tomorrow, you have to make decisions today, right? So that proactive nature, completely agree. And I, and I think that's where a lot of our business relationships, you know, we, we're building our own ecosystem. We have to. Our, our farmers have an ecosystem. We work with our farmers' ecosystems. We work with they're John Deere dealers. We work with their climate reps. We work with their CPA firms. We work with their banker. Why do we do that? Because we're really trying to solve the farmer's needs. And the farmer's needs is more than just what's on the farm, right? So, uh, you know, that takes proactivity. You really have to think uh, uh, about the future to do these things right. It's not easy, as you know. Awesome. That brings us to the end of our open questions. Um, a big thanks again for joining us here today. We're going to continue this dialogue. I heard some really pressing questions we continually get within ag, right? The carbon market. How can I tap into that? What does it take to get there? Um, data security and privacy. I want to bring Anitha, who's our present COO, to talk about this in a bigger in a bigger way, because this is something that's, you know, plaguing some folks. And it's interesting because other people are thinking, aren't thinking so much about like who owns my data, right? Say I work with a company such as Conservice, but then I leave the company. Where does that data go? Who owns it? Those are really good, you know, questions to ask those service providers. So again, a big thanks to everybody. And I'll be sending out this recording in a couple of weeks time.